shut her down. All right. Well, thank you. I, um, I, I do want to thank Pastor Dave for sharing the pulpit and um, for y'all allowing me to uh, bring God's Word to you this morning. Uh, Dana and I moved to Greeley in 2005, and we've always really liked Eaton. Um, it, when we moved here, I, I must admit, when I first told Dana that, I thought God was calling us to Greeley, um, primarily because of St. Patrick Presbyterian Church down in, in Greeley. She grew up in Boulder and was just downfallen upon hearing that she might be moving to Greeley. Um, but it's been a great combination for us. She fell in love with the town and with the community and with the people here. And the beautiful thing, she grew up in Colorado. She can look west and see the mountains. I grew up in Texas. I can look east and see the great wide open plains and the big skies. So we are very, very happy here. And, and um, I have a special affinity for Eaton uh, in that it just reminds me of some of the small West Texas towns um, that I spend a lot of time in. So neat people here, and we um, do appreciate you letting us be a part of this community. Well, the, the sermon title today is called A Snake in a Desert, and I, I titled it that. One, I don't like titling sermons, but you kind of have to, and so I came up with Snake in the Desert, which is true, but in reality, the sermon title probably should be The Deadliness of Discontent. But don't you think more people would attend if you had like Snake in the Desert? It just sounds cool, you know. <laughs> Deadliness of discontent, everybody's going to stay home and not want to hear about that. But basically, what God's saying here is he's, he's saying to us through this text that there is a deadliness associated with discontent. And why don't you turn with me into your Bibles, into chapter 21 of Numbers. So Numbers 21, and we're going to read verses 4 through 9. Okay, so the Israelites have been um, freed from slavery in Egypt. They're wandering in the desert. Now, we say wandering, but they are under the guidance of the Lord and Moses, of course. So they've been in the desert, and they've left Mount Hor, and I'll read from um, verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out along the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and, they, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many, of I many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that He take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth would be true, that your spirit would go forth, that the gospel would go forth through this biblical text, and Lord, that lives would be transformed by your truth, your gospel, and your goodness, your mercy and your grace, that it reign forever. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as I said, we're kind of looking at the deadliness of discontent. And in order to understand that, we're going to look at three things. Our rebellion against God, our repentance before God, and our restoration by God. And so as we look first at our rebellion against God, you look at the Israelites and you've got to say to yourself, well, of course, Neil, they're in the desert. They're miserable. Who wouldn't be miserable in the desert? But what you also have to understand is that just because you have nothing or you might be in a difficult environment does not necessarily equate to misery. I mean, think about it. Some of the wealthiest people in our world or in our country, our world today, are some of the most miserable people. You know, it's not just a fact of comfort, creature comforts that 
keeps you from discontent. There's something more here because God has been providing for them. You know, they've had food. They've had water. God has graciously given them sustenance so that they can live in the middle of a wasteland. And yet, they are complaining. So what is it? If it's not creature comforts that they're just complaining about, what is it? And it's something much, much deeper. And it's called sin. Shocker. But it's within every single one of us in this room. And we are all capable of falling into this trap of discontentment. If we look back at the Bible, and further back in the Bible, and you look at Adam and Eve, what did they have? They had paradise. Absolute paradise. They didn't have a need, a want, a care in the world. They didn't have to worry about time clocks. They didn't have to worry about taxes. They didn't have to worry about sickness. And yet, they experienced discontentment. Because the serpent came up to them and said, this place looks pretty good. And they said, yeah, it's really good. We really like it here. This is great. We can do anything we want. Oh, can you do anything? And then they began to wonder, wait, now we can't do anything. We, we can't eat of this tree over here. And the serpent had to say something to, to the effect of, it must be a hundred times better than all the other trees. And what happened? Then they began to question, is God really good? Is God really good? Does God really care about my well-being and about what my needs are? And that led into discontentment. And we all know the story. They went. They didn't trust that God was good. And they said, I have to bring goodness for myself. And so they took and ate from the tree. The Israelites, look at what they say here in verse 5. I just love this. Um, let's see. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? I mean, do you remember what Egypt was? For 400 years, they were slaves. They had to build bricks out of straw. They were beaten, and yet they are saying that Egypt was better than what you're giving me now. And they're talking about worthless food, and yet it was manna from heaven provided by God. What is it for you today? That's the question. Where's your discontentment? And a lot of you are in a position where you say, you know, I'm discontent because, and I don't believe God is good, because I have followed the rules. I have kept my nose clean. I have done what's right. I have towed the line. And yet, I'm not happy. God is not giving me what I deserve. Some of you also don't see God as being good, and you're saying, I'm so bad. I have broken all the rules. I have done it my way, as Frank Sinatra said. I've done it my way, and now I don't have to do it anybody else's way. And yet, God is just vindictive, and He is going to punish me for doing it my way. God is vindictive, and He's not good. So as you can see, we're all in this realm of discontentment at some point in time in our lives. And what boils down to is the fact that you don't believe God is good. You really don't believe that God is good and out for your best interest. And yet, you have to recognize that that discontentment is sin. And as a result, you have to repent. And you say, well, how can I repent if I don't believe that God is good? I mean, what good is that going to do me? Bear with me and hold on. But let's look at what true repentance looks like. What does our repentance before God look like? Basically... Three things. I'm going to read you this text. If we can look at chapter, uh, same chapter, and let's look at verses 6 through 7. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Okay, so let's look at repentance. And true repentance is is made up of three things. In order for you to have really true repentance, you have to have three things. The first thing you have to do is you have to renounce the sin. Okay, so you have to know the sin. You have to know what it is, and you have to renounce it. Secondly, you have to have sorrow for the sin. So you have to be sorrowful 
for that sin. And third, you have to turn away from the sin. One way you can think about it is you have to know with your head what the sin is. You have to be grieving in your heart for the sin. And then you have to actively turn away with your heel or heels. Turn away from the sin. So those three things comprise equals true repentance. And so let's look and see what Israel's done. Israel, sure, they've renounced a sin. Renounced a sin. They said in verse 7, We have sinned and spoken against the Lord and against you. And so they've identified it. How about you today? Can you identify your sin of discontentment? Do you see it before you? Do you know what it is? Has somebody else brought it to your attention? How many of you are dissatisfied with the situation you're in these days? And so you're wanting to always change jobs or move houses or change friends. You're one of those people where you think grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. But what you don't realize is that grass is over a septic tank. You've heard that. So, you know, you've got those where you're you're just unhappy with your situation. What about you? Some others who are unhappy with themselves. You know, and they they engage in retail therapy where they go out and they spend to try to make themselves feel better. And yet, when the bill comes, it's a vicious cycle because then they realize what they've done. And they still feel dissatisfied. Or what about some of you, if you're on Facebook... And you get the Facebook blues because you're always looking at other families and other people and other activities that folks are doing and you're not getting to do those things. And you enter into discontentment. How many of you are hypercritical of others and try to be so so that you can elevate your own self-esteem, whether it be the wait staff or your own children or a coworker? We all have areas of discontentment. And the important thing is that we identify and renounce those sins of discontentment. Then you have to look at sorrow for the sin. Do you really have sorrow for the sin? We went camping this this summer, and one of the activities that Karis, our middle daughter, our six-year-old girl, likes to do is pick up any animal out there. And she happened to find a whole mess of garter snakes. I mean, it was like she had handfuls of these things and looked like Medusa. Yeah, and see, some of y'all are out there going, whoa. I mean, it's pretty scary after two days with your kids. You start not to recognize them when they've been in the woods that long. But then when they come out with snakes, it's really frightening. Well, here, I thought of this text because here she has these garter snakes and she's walking all around this campground. And you could always know where Karis was because you would hear, oh, no, 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 don't come over here. We don't want those snakes over here. And you'd say, okay, she's over there. And a little bit later, you'd hear on this side of the campground, oh, no, 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 we can't have snakes here. Get those out of here. And you know, okay, she's over there. Well, look, it's the same way with the Israelites. What they're doing, and I believe this is their true heart, they don't have real sorrow for their sin. They're just saying, take these snakes away from us. In other words, what they're saying to God is they're saying, God, we want you to be a magic genie. Take these snakes away. Get them out of our presence. Don't let us suffer. And we've all been there before where you're suffering and, oh, God, if you would just get me out of this situation, I'll never do X, Y, Z again. You know, where we treat God as a magic genie. But Paul talks about two types of real grief or real sorrow for sin. One is godly grief, and the other is worldly grief. And godly grief looks something more like this. Psalm 51, where David, after committing adultery and murdering and breaking all ten commandments, do you realize that? David, King David, broke all ten commandments in his acts. He says this. In godly grief, he says, Against you... And, o- and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your word and blameless in your judgment. So right there, what David is saying and what godly grief looks like, it says, Lord, you are justified in whatever judgment you bring against my sin. 
whatever it is. You don't make excuses. You don't blame. You don't ask to, for it to be just taken away so you can live life comfortably. But anything you send in justi is justified. Your heart is transformed to that. And then secondly, your heart grieves for the fact that you have grieved the Lord. And he goes on to write, or to say, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Can you pray that in the midst of confessing your sin of discontentment? Can you say that as you acknowledge that yes, this does grieve the Lord and that it grieves you as well? Can you, do you know your sin in your head? Does it grieve you in your heart? Or are you like the Israelites where it's more of just take these symptoms away? Is it a worldly grief where it's take these symptoms away or is it an embarrassment that you got caught? Or are you facing consequences that you don't want to face? Godly grief or worldly grief? And lastly, you have to turn away from the sin. So once you know it, once you feel it, then you have to act and move upon it. So head, heart, and heels. And you turn from that sin and you say, I'm not going to engage in that again. And I'm not going to be discontent. And I'm not going to ask for more than what you believe I deserve. And you're going to come across this. You're not going to walk away, and I'm not going to tell you that everybody in this room, or anybody in this room for that matter, will be perfectly free from sin. We will sin again and again and again. But what is different now is think of your life as all the images on your phone. The government's listening to you anyway. No, I don't know. <laughs> That's just conspiracy theorists. I thought I'd throw it out there. So, Now, but think about if everything was recorded on your phone and it was recorded on your film strip or on your camera roll or whatever you've got, what you would begin to see is a pattern where in the beginning you would see, yes, there is quite a bit of discontentment. There is more discontentment, more discontentment. And then over time, there's less and less and less. And that sin of discontentment, why it may not ever go away this side of heaven, it will start to dissipate and you will be more content because you will understand that God is good. And we're going to get to that. Because remember, the whole reason we're discontent is because we don't believe God is good. And then secondly, we have to repent. But how do we repent if we don't believe we can repent to a good God? Well, let's look and see who this good God is. And we see this in our restoration by God. Let's continue reading in 7, and we'll do the second half of 7 through the end of the chapter. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent, and live. Now you're saying, right, God's a good God. Look here. Moses prayed and the snake stayed, right? Because they, they weren't gone. But what if God had taken those snakes completely out of the camp? What would that have done? All it would have done was have fostered the Israelites' understanding that God is a magic genie, which he's not. They would have said, you know, if we're ever in a hard pinch, we just pray and God will take it away. It doesn't matter what our heart's like. He is our magic genie, but he's not. Instead, he's a loving father. And God lovingly uses this to paint a picture for us and for the Israelites that discontentment is deadly. But he provides a solution because he loves him. And what does he do? He creates, he has Moses create a bronze snake. And the snakes are still there. They're still in their presence. They're still biting people. However, there's a solution because what Moses does now, and he makes this bronze snake, he puts it on a pole so that everyone can see it. And anyone, anyone, anyone in that camp who looks upon that bronze snake is immediately healed. Some of you might be thinking, well, see, the book, the Bible, is just a book about rules. And if I do the rules, then God is good. 
But that's not true. The Bible is not a book about rules. The Bible is a story about how God saves sinners like you and I. Or like you and me. Me? Yeah, thanks. Dana's my grammar gal. Um, Like you and me. And let me explain. The whole reason we have this seen in the Bible is to show that God is good. Because many, many, many years later, after God has sent His Son to earth, Jesus is meeting with a religious ruler named Nicodemus. And he's reading, or he's there talking, and he's having questions about... And he says, Nicodemus says to Jesus, he says, I know that you are from God because nobody could do the things you do. And Jesus says this. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then it goes right into that verse that we all know. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Do you see what God's doing? With this bronze snake, with their disobedience, God is foreshadowing a Savior to come. He's foreshadowing the fact that He is a good God and He is going to provide a champion, one who will defeat all sin and provide you with life. Just as Moses was lifted up, so was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took on the venom of sin. Jesus Christ was lifted up and was given the venom that you deserve for your sin. The death that you deserve Christ took upon Himself. And through His resurrection, we will never, ever, ever have to face death. But what do we have to do? We have to look. What did the Israelites do? They looked. They didn't muster up good deeds. They didn't bring 129 shoeboxes more than their neighbor. They looked upon the Savior. And they received His salvation by grace. People, that is available for you through Jesus Christ today. He is your bronze snake. In the midst of your discontentment, you can look and you can see that God is good. God has provided a way for you to live. For eternity. In spite of your sin. And what that does is it leads you, once you realize it and recognize His goodness, it moves you into true repentance. Repentance from the head where you know what you've done, from the heart where you've grieved this good God who's given so much to you. And yet you move with your heels in a different direction to avoid that sin. And through that, the rebellion and the discontent becomes less and less And you are a child of God. Let me leave you with this. Does anybody have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance? What's on the shield? Serpent and a pole. Has anybody been to a hospital? Serpent and a pole. Has anybody seen the side of an ambulance? Serpent and a pole. That's the caduceus. And basically, whenever you see that, I want you to remember... Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that all who believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that You help us to identify our discontent, that we can identify it, that we can be saddened by it, and that we can be move to turn away from it. And Lord, that in doing so, we would become closer to You, that we would be able to advance Your kingdom, that we would be able to do Your will. And Father, as we walk through life and as we encounter discontent, help us to remember that snake on the pole. Help us to remember 
Jesus on the cross and help us to remember the life that you have given to us through Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.